Namo Buddhaya, Namaste. Back to basics. The Buddha taught just two things. There is suffering and there is an end to suffering. And it is the end of suffering that I'm going to talk about now. Buddhist teachings go back for 2,566 years and are made up of a huge volume of works and in addition to that many, many commentaries. But the underlying teachings of the Buddha are very simple and it's these underlying simple teachings that I am going to talk about right now because it is with this understanding that we can become free from suffering. So let's look at this. The Buddha taught the four noble truths. They are, there is suffering, a cause of suffering, an end to suffering, and the path leading to the end of suffering. This is how he described this twofold aspect of suffering and end of suffering. That there is suffering, but there's a cause. There is an end of suffering, and there is a way to end suffering, okay? So it's still two things, but a cause and a way out of it. A cause into suffering and a way out of suffering. This is the simplicity, the beauty of the Buddha's teachings. Quite easy to understand, isn't it? Now, I'll wiggle around a little. I'm suffering a little here. <laughs> but let's take it from the beginning. What is suffering? Well, suffering is not wanting something you have or wanting something you can't have. I want an ice cream, I cannot have one, that is suffering. I have a headache, I do not want it, that is suffering. The key word is wanting. And all wanting is, is desire. And it can be desire to have something that you want, you can't have, or the desire to not have something that you don't want, that you do have. It's as simple as that. And it is this desire that is actually the cause of suffering. Why? Because we think, because we cannot have something, or because we have something we don't want, that this is unsatisfactory. And for that moment, it is unsatisfactory. But when we understand through this practice, through these teachings, that that feeling of unsatisfactoriness is impermanent, it changes, then we become less affected by it. But that comes later. So suffering is just wanting something you can't have or not wanting something you have got. The cause of suffering is that desire. So that's the first noble truth and the cause, the second noble truth. Now, the third noble truth, more interesting, there is an end to suffering. Can you believe that? You don't need to believe it. The Buddha didn't teach anything that needed to be believed, just understood through your own experience. Now, we've all had a desire for something we couldn't have, or a desire to get rid of something we've got, a headache, for instance, and we are suffering. But it isn't permanent. Like I just said, it's impermanent, it changes. And when the headache is gone, you are no longer suffering. So, in a small way, that is the end of suffering. If you desire an ice cream, when you get the ice cream, it is the end of suffering. If you don't get to have the ice cream, very soon afterwards, another desire will arise for something else and you would have forgotten all about the ice cream. That suffering is ended. So that's very simple. We are experiencing the end of suffering continuously. But what we're not doing is we're only concentrating on the suffering. So Buddhism often gets wrongly thought of as teaching all about suffering. Well, it really isn't. It's teaching all about the end of suffering. But suffering is the word that gets picked up. In the Pali language, suffering is dukkha. And actually, dukkha really translates better into English as 
unsatisfactory. The exact translation of it is, is like an axle in a wheel, off centre, so the wheel trundles along unsatisfactorily with a wobble, is really what it means. So suffering is important to understand because we cannot get rid of it before we know what it is. The cause of suffering is very important to understand because we cannot get rid of suffering without understanding and appreciating fully its cause. The end of suffering we are experiencing all of the time. So the fourth noble truth is the path leading towards the end of suffering. And this is called the Noble Eightfold Path. So it has four, eight points to it. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration or meditation. Now, to sum these eight points up, we can simply say three more Pali words, sila, samadhi, panya. I'm not going to use many Pali words. I don't like to and I don't know many, but there are some important Pali words, like dukkha, we translate as suffering, but it really means a whole sentence of unsatisfactoriness and an explanation. But it's a useful word because we know what it means and it sums up a longer explanation. So for instance, sila means moral virtue, good behavior, being nice, being kind, doing no harm. But one word, sila, sums all that up. Samadhi, remember it's sila, samadhi, panya. Samadhi is meditation. You would have heard of samadhi meditation, vipassana meditation. You may not have heard of those. You may have heard of sort of concentrated, focused, one-pointedness meditation, or you may have heard of mindfulness. Samadhi in this context includes all of that, the development of the mind to really see how things are clearly. And that is what vipassana means, to see clearly. Samadhi means more, more than concentration, it means focused, focused on a single point or object. And this is how we sharpen our focus, our powers of concentration, without actually concentrating. With a strained effort, we develop the ability to concentrate through the practice of relaxing our minds, our bodies, and focusing on one thing only for some time in order for our minds to get used to being concentrated on the present moment, here and now, what is actually happening, rather than drifting off into the future or back into the past. Samadhi. And Panya, remember, Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Panya is translated as wisdom, and that's a good translation. But it is wisdom, it's not knowledge, it's not intellectual learning, it's understanding. It's understanding the nature of our suffering, not having a detailed intellectual explanation for it. It's understanding the actual feeling of it when it arises and the feeling of it when it goes away. Because with mindfulness, understanding that, understanding the difference is how we learn and are able to stop the suffering. So, we can sum up the Noble Eightfold Path of right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration or meditation as sila, samadhi, panya. Good behavior, if you like, meditation, if you like, and wisdom. Good behavior, meditation, and wisdom. Now, what the teachers, teachings of the Buddha are saying is that we must firstly understand there is suffering. Now, can we deny that? No. There is dukkha. It's all around us, ever present, all of the time. There's a cause of suffering. Can we deny that? No. There has to be a cause for everything. 
And if we look at our suffering, we can see the cause. It is desire for having something we don't want or wanting something we can't have. We can see that, okay? And there being an end of suffering, well, it's a fact. You can see this each and every day. One minute you're happy, the next minute you're sad. When you're happy, the suffering of being sad is gone. When you're happy and then you're no longer happy, new suffering arises for the fact you're no longer happy. What it is, it's suffering arising, passing away, arising, passing away, moment to moment, moment to moment. If you like, you could call this rebirth in this lifetime. If you're not believing in rebirth anywhere else, we are continuously being reborn every moment. But that's more for another video. For now, we're looking at this suffering. It's arising, it's passing away. So that is the end of suffering. And we know from the cause of suffering and the end of suffering that there has to be a way to reduce this suffering and finally end suffering fully to become free from suffering in this lifetime. Not waiting until we die and hoping that we were good and we go to a heaven. Because that would require belief, which is more suffering. Because what if it's not true? There's always this doubt. So if we fully accept there's suffering, there's a cause of suffering, an end of suffering, then what are we accepting? Only the truth. You cannot argue with the truth. There's no alternative to the truth. There is no doubt in the truth. You don't need to believe the truth. This is why it's called the Four Noble Truths. And the fourth truth is the Noble Eightfold Path. And the truth, the undeniable truth in that, is that if you operate, or you continue with good behavior, and you practice meditation, you will develop wisdom. And when you develop wisdom, you reach a very deep and full understanding of the nature of suffering, which means that you are no longer affected by suffering. Now, to some extent, with this practice of the Noble Eightfold Path of Sila, Samadhi, Panya, of good behavior, meditation, and developing our minds, our wisdom, you have to have a certain amount of faith, but not belief. Let's translate or consider the word faith as confidence. But you don't have to have some eternal confidence that is drummed into you. Just try it. Experience it for yourself. Sila, moral virtue, is practiced by Buddhists by taking just five precepts. The five precepts are no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no taking of intoxicants. If we keep these five precepts, and you don't have to believe me, you don't have to believe Buddhists, you don't even have to believe the Buddha, he did not ask of that. He said, go and experience it for yourself. Try for yourself. So, if you keep those five precepts, no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no taking of intoxicants, you will then be able, more easily, to practice meditation. So that's sila, then comes samadhi practice meditation. Why? Because meditation is about sitting, stilling the body and the mind in order that everything settles down and you can see clearly, like sand settling in water, the water becomes clear, you can see through. With crystal vision, you can see, understand suffering and the cause of suffering the end of suffering. And when you see this, the impermanence of suffering, the uncertainty of suffering, you can see how suffering isn't the suffering you've always believed it to be. One minute it's there, and then it is gone. And you can make it go completely through meditation. 
because through meditation we can attain to levels of samadhi, this focused, concentrated meditation, in the sitting meditation practice, and another Pali word, jhanas, but let's think of them as stages of samadhi, in our bodily level, rupa, jhana rupa, rupa jhanas, the bodily rupas, and then arupa jhanas, which are our mental, emotional rupas, another four, four and four. But that doesn't matter, this is for another video. For now, all we need to know is in meditation, we can become free from suffering. But you don't believe me, you don't believe Buddhists, you don't believe the Buddha. You try it for yourself, experiencing it, experience, to experience it and see this truth yourself. But it does require sila. Because without sila, you're not free in your mind. Let's say you killed something, or you told a lie, or you stole something. You sit down to meditate. What's going to be on your mind? That. Even if it was a while ago, it will be on your mind. What's going to happen about that? So simply by keeping sila, it's one less thing to bother you during your practice of meditation. But less simply, it's a whole lot more than that. Because karma then comes into it, another Pali word, that you've heard banded about for all sorts of different meanings, but really it just means action, cause and effect. All our actions have consequences, and if we do bad actions through body, speech and mind, then it will affect us eventually. And this is going to be in our minds when we come to meditate. So this is why these three parts of that Noble Eightfold Path, Sila, Samadhi, Panya, are so important. It takes all three to succeed in this practice of becoming free from suffering. So, we practice Sila, keep Sila. We practice meditation, and this then develops wisdom in our minds. Wisdom, not in an intellectual level, not understanding all of the teachings of the Buddha, all 84,000 suttas, all of the commentaries that have been added on over the 2,566 years since about those teachings that amount to volumes and volumes and libraries and libraries of material you could study. This is all very interesting too. So is the history of the Buddha and the history of Buddhism. Again, this is for another video. I've got so many videos, li ideas lining up just through talking about the basics of Buddhism. Because it leads one thing to another to another, like a Google search. You go to just search for one thing, and what have you done next? You've clicked on a link that's kind of relevant to the one thing, and then it goes to another link to another link. Before you know it, you don't even know what you were looking for. But with Buddhism, it does do that, links to another thing to another thing to another thing. I think they're called hyperlinks, aren't they? But it's always bringing you back to the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path, why? Because more than just Sila Samadhi Panya, summing it up as those three things, if ever you're stuck in life, you can say, what would the Mo Noble Eightfold Path tell me? So you look at right view. Now right view means right understanding. Wisdom, in effect. It's the last of those three, Sila Samadhi Panya. You've developed wisdom, you've got the right view. Your wisdom is that the Four Noble Truths are just that, four truths. You have to actually fully accept those truths, not learning them, knowing them, but understanding them, living by them, knowing they are the truth, without believing, just knowing for sure, because it's the only sure thing the truth. We're never sure how long we're going to live, but the truth is we will die. You cannot doubt that, there's no argument to it. This physical body will stop working. So, wisdom is right view. Right intention, very, very important. If we walk along this path, I'm not a Jain monk who would have a little broom going ahead to sweep any insects out the way. I may, under these leaves, tread on something inadvertently. 
hopefully not a cobra and certainly not a python there are those here but uh, I could damage kill harm one of these creatures but I certainly didn't do it intentionally but if a mosquito lands there and it is annoying me a bit and I go whack and slap it and kill it that was intentional it may have been to some extent reaction so there's some wiggle room flexibility but there is no killing these five precepts are un non-negotiable <laughs> there is no killing mosquitoes like with the fifth one there is no having just one glass of wine it doesn't work like that the reason it works is because you have to put your trust in them not belief trust to try it for yourself so intention is very important if our intention is to do no harm our intention is to keep the precepts but accidentally through other people's fault condition on uh, our conditions fault circumstances these get broken it isn't the same because of course the consequences will also be different if you accidentally ran over somebody because they walked out in front of you there would be no criminal proceedings if it was fully clear that they walked out in front of you and you couldn't stop so you see it's not killing it's not intentional so intention is very important right speech well this is a whole thing a whole thing and lots of videos we could do on right speech it's um, also in the Noble Eightfold Path I'm on the Noble Eightfold Path it also comes into the five precepts uh, the fourth one no lying but right speech is much more than no lying of course it means no lying but it also means no gossiping no bad talking about people and this and that and the other sometimes people think of this as the fourth precept but no that fourth precept is has to be clear no lying does my bottom look fat in this dress I'm afraid dear yes it does <laughs> you don't have to be like that no you can say I'm not sure I'm the wrong person to ask maybe you could ask this person here and pass the blame but you don't have to lie so don't so right speech in the Noble Eightfold Path the third one very important also they're all important but if you have a question like over this is my bottom fat in this you can refer to the Noble Eightfold Path it says right speech and it's also the precepts no lying then right action right action is everything we do everything we can cause to make karma all of our actions are through body speech mind so if you think about it intention was mind intending speaking saying something is speech number three action number four is with our bodies biff someone on the nose punch it's bad it's action you've harmed someone no good self-explanatory okay number five is uh, right livelihood now we must strive if we can to have a livelihood that is keeping the precepts so working in an abattoir killing animals for food is not acceptable as right livelihood uh, working in a hospital making people better well let's balance it out in a veterinary surgeons making animals better is right livelihood but then for a whole nother talk another video in the future putting animals down euthanasia is killing so that's not good doesn't mean you can't work in a veterinary surgeon though so one has to use your judgment and wisdom on these things but if in doubt on a point in the Noble Eightfold Path you can refer to the precepts where there's no wriggle room so if you doubt about number three right speech is it right or wrong speech to tell the truth about the size of someone's bottom in a dress refer to number four of the five precepts number four of the five precepts you cannot lie you see there's your answer it's there it's our guidebook our 
instructions for life, more importantly our instructions, to be ha instructions on how to be happy. Number five, what was that? Right livelihood. Number six, right effort. Right effort can be applied and it gets applied in different ways. Some apply it to keeping all of the precepts um, and doing good deeds, giving, helping, this, that and the other. Others apply, uh, uh, refer to it as applying to the effort we put into the next two, mindfulness, uh, mindfulness and, and concentration, meditation basically. Really it's right effort in adhering to the entire Noble Eightfold Path, keeping the precepts and because it's involving effort which implies energy I tend to associate it mostly with meditation. Right effort in the practice of meditation because meditation does require effort. Sometimes of course so do keeping precepts and following the Noble Eightfold Path. But really there should be no effort in keeping the precepts because if you are keeping the precepts you are refraining from killing, not killing. Refraining from stealing, not stealing. Refraining from sexual misconduct, not sexual misconduct. Refraining from lying and refraining from taking intoxicants. You're not doing. No effort is required to not do. The effort is in restraint, which is the only doing, which isn't a tangible doing. Whereas meditation requires effort to sit correctly, meditate and have the discipline to do it each and every day. And this is going to be more videos on meditation also. Remember we're back to the basics of Buddhism in this. I'm getting towards the end, I will sum up, but the basics of Buddhism are so important because it is also the highest Dharma, the highest level of Buddhism there is. Because it's how to become free from suffering. So that was right effort, right mindfulness. Now this is part of our meditation but also the meditation we take from sitting in meditation away with us when we leave our meditation sitting place, cushion, chair, wherever we meditate, in a group, alone, doesn't matter. When we finish meditation it does not finish. We continue mindfully going about our duties, doing our daily tasks carefully. Mindfulness just really means carefully. If we're being careful, we're walking along a very narrow path on the edge of a deep fall, we do it carefully. That's mindfulness. It's nothing magic, nothing special, but it has huge results because it helps us develop samadhi, which is the final eighth part of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is developing awareness of one object a focused, conscious awareness of say the breath or a point that you can recognize in the breath or any other meditation object that suits you. The breath is always good because it's always with you. But Samadhi Vipassana, mindfulness concentration, the two forms of meditation are like two sides of the same hand, one doesn't work without the other. By developing mindfulness in everyday life, being careful, you become more aware, which enables you when you're sitting to focus and develop concentration, which then sharpens the focus, the mind power, to become more careful, more mindful in your daily activities. Vipassana, seeing clearly, samadhi, focused, conscious awareness. So, the uh, phone is the other way around so I don't know how long I've talked for, but I want to sum up. There's so many more things I can talk about now, because one thing has led to another, but in summation the Buddha taught two things, suffering and the end of suffering. Then he gave us the cause of suffering, which is desire, and he gave us the way out of suffering, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. And in summary, 
the teachings of that are sila, samadhi, panya. So, good behaviour, five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no lying. Sorry, no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no taking of intoxicants. And samadhi, or meditation, which is mindfulness, vipassana, concentration, samadhi. Meditation, sitting formally, meditation as we're walking around, being careful, mindful. So he's saying, keep precepts, or Buddhism is saying, keep precepts. Sit regularly in meditation, and I'll make many videos about meditation, because it is my favourite activity. It is my job here in the forest to sit and meditate. That's what I do, mostly, six hours, nine hours a day. This bit, you see, takes me no more than one hour a day. A couple of shorts, they take 60 seconds each, and this, whatever length this video is, is as long as it's taken, because you'll see from the results, there's no editing. In the interests of the fourth precept, no lying, and third of the Noble Eightfold Path, right speech, this isn't the first take. I've started this video many times today, but that was because I was wandering around and it was getting hot in one place, then <laughs> insects in another, noisy in another. So I didn't sit for this long. It's just every time I started, I'd have to move to somewhere else. Now the time of day is such that it's cooling. People are asleep. It's afternoon. Uh, and this part of my little forest where I stay is, I'm right by the well. The well is behind the camera. I wouldn't like the camera to fall in the well because that's a very long way down. Um, this spot is ideal for this little talk with you. So, yes, meditation, as I was saying, that's all I do. But you don't have to just meditate. Uh, as lay people, uh, you can practice meditation to whatever suits you. As long as you understand that uh, mindfulness can be practiced all of the time. Bringing your attention back to the breath whilst you're walking around, not doing anything else. When you're just going from A to B, you can practice mindfulness. And we can talk about that in further videos also. So, keeping this constraint to the talk in question, the basics of Buddhism, after we've practiced meditation, we will have developed wisdom. And this wisdom, this clear seeing of the impermanence of suffering, which is so much towards the understanding and the relief and the ending of suffering, knowing that it is impermanent, um, is the really key and way out of suffering. Because wisdom is knowing the Four Noble Truths are that, just that, the truth, and that everything is impermanent, uncertain, changes. It brings me quickly on now to the three faculties of existence, which there is in a previous video more in, uh, detailed discussion on. So it is still part and incorporated in basics, but that is just that wisdom is knowing the Four Noble Truths, as I mean understanding, not just learning them, knowing and understanding it is there is the truth. You cannot say that there is no suffering, there always is. You cannot say there isn't a cause, there always is. You cannot say it doesn't end, because we see it all the time. And you can practice the path leading to the end of suffering by just doing that and experiencing for yourself that that does work. And that is just sila, samadhi, panya. Sounds like I'm going round in circles back and forth over the same thing. Yes, I am, on purpose, because this is how we learn the practice. And this is panya, wisdom, developing and understanding, unknowing of this life free from suffering, the Four Noble Truths. And the first stage of enlightenment, sotapanna, another Pali word, translated into English as stream enterer, so the first stage of enlightenment requires, or let's say, is as a result of fully knowing the Four Noble Truths. 
also abandoning rites and rituals and personality view. So ego, if you like, self-identity. But that's another talk again for another video. But wisdom is very much made up of the Four Noble Truths. So the Buddha's teachings on suffering and an end of suffering, additionally qualified by the Four Noble Truths, and I'll repeat it again, I'm never ashamed to do so, of there is suffering, a cause of suffering, an end of suffering, and a path leading to the end of suffering, and that path of right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, is the entire teachings of the Buddha from 2,566 years ago, albeit it's made up of 84,000 different suttas in some 22,000 pages vol of volumes of books, 12 times bigger than the Bible, it still just boils down to that basic understanding of suffering and end of suffering. So the very basic of Bud basics of Buddhism is also the very highest level of understanding of Buddhism. Because even if you knew the entire uh, Buddhist teachings in your own language and in the Pali language, from start to finish, if you didn't fully appreciate with feeling, knowledge and understanding the Four Noble Truths, then you are not on the first stage even of enlightenment of Sotapanna, a stream enterer, because that is a requirement. It is the enlightenment stage is as a result of that understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So if anything, we concentrate on that, the basics of Buddhism, to get the highest qualification in Buddhism, which is ultimately enlightenment for another video. I hope I haven't rambled too much. When I turn this uh, device around, I'll see how long I've spoken for. Um, and uh, I hope I've just summed up concisely the basics of Buddhism. And I've tried to keep it in one language, English, and I've used a couple of Pali words because they are essential Pali words we need to know because they're more descriptive or easier to use and you'll hear them so commonly than the whole sentences that we translate them into, or few words we translate them into. So I'll say the Namo Tassa, which is our paying homage to the Buddha, and give you a short blessing for those who may have noticed I don't do that at the beginning, it's because I want people to watch these videos. And I shouldn't say this, but maybe some people don't look at videos for very long if they have too much of an introduction. And too much chanting at the beginning may put some people who are not used to that off. It may encourage other people. But you know, I'm always mindful myself of what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and who I'm doing it for. I do make other videos of just chanting, and you can look at those, and I enjoy doing that. But I'm trying to keep the videos appropriate to their titles and not mix it all up too much, so that you can select. Because I'm not sure what's most popular, because there's equal amounts of viewings for the different things, as you can see looking at this whole thing. So, I will end this little talk right now and hopefully it will have time to upload this for this evening uh, because I did promise the next video would come out soon and it will be about this. So, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Sabiti o hiwa jan tu sabaro go vinyasa tu mate bawata wantarayo suki di ga yu ko bawam. Suki hotu, suki hotu, suki hotu. Be happy, be well, 
practice meditation, try and keep the precepts, don't beat yourself up about it if you slip on the precepts. It's about intention, remember? Trying. So, if you turned off before the chanting, you've missed that little tip at the end. Because we are striving to become free from suffering in this very lifetime. Striving, effort, trying. We may not always succeed, but we will get there with practice. And the practice itself has its rewards throughout. Meditation is more rewarding than anything we can do in the material world when you learn how to do it correctly. So keep watching these videos because I will share with you my understanding and my experiences of meditation. Well, at least as far as I'm allowed under our monastic rules to share with you our experiences I will be doing that in future videos along with all the other subjects that have come up with that rabbit hole of talking <laughs> that I'm going into again. So, Namo Buddhaya, Namaste, be happy, be well, and thank you for watching. Namo Buddhaya.